There we go. Okay, so I'm going to record the meeting so we can uh, post it to uh, uh, post it to uh, YouTube here uh, later. Uh, uh, again, this is uh, Radio Relay International Course uh, TR002, Introduction to the RRI Traffic System. And in many respects, also, it's an introduction to, to NTS, with uh, which we're, we're interoperable, of course. Uh, so tonight, we're going to talk about the structure of the traffic system. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how NTS and RRI work together uh, at times, some of the independent things RRI does. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how uh, we conf configure, perhaps I should say, reconfigure networks uh, for um, uh, emergency communication situations. And we're going to talk about some of the specialized functions, such as the wind link uh, to RRI gateways, and also uh, talk a little bit about the new uh, certified uh, precedents uh, associated with the with the uh, fast telegram messages. So and a little bit about the background on those. So there's some new information here that uh, that's uh, definitely uh, uh, going to be of, of importance as we move into 2025. So let's uh, go to the beginning. And so this program was originally uh, developed in 2016. Uh, and of course, we've updated it uh, here for uh, uh, for 2024, uh, 2025. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about RRI just uh, for the sake of, uh, of those that might be here for the first time. But, but RRI was formed essentially in 2016 out of the assets of the, the old uh, ARRL National Traffic System. And its purpose was to, uh, uh, number one, improve the, the uh, traffic system, uh, uh, bring it up into the 21st century, uh, make it relevant, and uh, of course, uh, uh, leverage its benefits, uh, let's say. Um, it also uh, recognized the fact that there were some serious uh, deficiencies in the way in which NTS had been uh, abrogated for a, a period of some years. So, you know, just a few things that we, we worked on over the, the, the uh, initial years of RRI included uh, updating the training materials, classes, and documents, uh, such as this course here, uh, of course, the RRI field manual, the, the training manuals, things of this nature. Uh, we uh, set about uh, improving relationships uh, and interoperability with uh, both uh, local and national emergency communications organizations. Uh, that, that was an area in which there had been somewhat of a, a dichotomy uh, between NTS uh, and, say, for example, Aries, Racy's, Oxcom for many years. Uh, there were reasons for this. We, we won't delve into them in the course, but a lot of it had to do with the divergence between how the two organizations managed or were managed and the fact that uh, little or no effort was made in, in harmonizing their methods so that uh, uh, they could be um, uh, support each other. Uh, so we went about correcting that. Uh, for many years, there was a net directory uh, available on the ARRL webpage, but it was terribly out of date and very consistently out of date and inaccurate. So uh, we developed the first uh, up-to-date curated net directory that had probably been issued in over three decades. Uh, we also, of course, uh, developed the first uh, national response plan uh, which has been tested through various emergency communications exercises, both with external agencies as well as uh, internally within RRI. And then, of course, we set about addressing the, the radiogram uh, ICS-213 uh, interoperability issue based on a, a fairly extensive survey of, of different methods that have been developed uh, in the MCOM community throughout uh, North America. And we, of course, uh, sought out the best practices and developed a, a methodology that, uh, that uh, uh, supported the various ICS-213 message forms that are out in the world. And, of course, uh, we worked uh, extensively, and we still do, with the WinLink development team uh, to find ways in which uh, we can symbiotically work together and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, engage in processes and methods that leverage the benefits of both organizations. Suffice to say, uh, the, the basic philosophy of RRI is that the, the best solutions come from a collegial 
and symbiotic uh, uh, set of relationships with other organizations active in public service communications. Uh, we don't seek to run the world. Uh, we don't have to run your local organization, uh, but we are here to provide training, uh, support, and a diverse infrastructure to, to complement uh, activities on the local level, as well as uh, activities from uh, other organizations uh, that operate, say, at, at the national or even international level. So again, the goal here is uh, to, to not necessarily be in control, uh, but to, to uh, whenever possible, work in a kind of con collegial manner uh, with, with other organizations. And I think we've been uh, uh, pretty successful in this. Uh, uh, we, we want to be non-political, and, and we've done our best to, to kind of stay out of that whole, uh, oh, I don't know, ham radio operators are, are generally great people, but there's always the few who, who, who kind of want to uh, uh, stand on top of the ham pile and control things, so we try to, to stay out of that. <laughs> we also try to be mode agnostic. Uh, uh, we uh, accommodate a wide variety of, of uh, modes and methods. Uh, in a way that uh, that uh, provides uh, the opportunity to leverage the benefits of different modes and applications uh, with the ultimate goal, however, being effective interoperability across networks and modes. We still support NTS. Um, you know, we want NTS to be successful. Uh, we encourage uh, its growth and evolution. Um, and we want the ARRL to be successful and, and we encourage uh, uh, sound management practices and, and, and its growth as well. Um, uh, however, we, we are capable of operating independently of NTS, uh, and we will do so when it's necessary to ensure a high level uh, or high quality of customer service, particularly in the, in the MCOM environment. But again, the goal would be better to have a, a cooperative relationship and, and coordinate when practical to do so. Uh, our basic philosophy might boil down to, to one general concept, and that is uh, we do believe that uh, quality organizations attract quality volunteers. Uh, our goal is to build a program that, uh, that stresses a professional grade um, uh, organization, and therefore we will attract people who seek out uh, a professional uh, uh, type of approach. Uh, to public service communications. Uh, so uh, much as, you know, you find young men who still want to join the Marine Corps, <laughs> you know, uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a high quality, high grade organization. Uh, same thing with, with RRI, we want to be a high quality organization that's attractive to, to people who really want to do something of, of value in their communities. On, on a more narrow philosophical perspective, uh, uh, we might assert that amateur radio can provide two types of basic emergency communication support. Uh, we might call these essential services and value added services. So, for example, an essential service would be providing connectivity, uh, communications and administrative support uh, in the absence of uh, commercial telecommunications, common carrier service or uh, on the rare occasion, uh, government networks. Uh, uh, when all else fails, as some people say. Uh, but we also recognize the reality that uh, radio amateurs, uh, uh, at least a significant number of radio amateurs, uh, seek out uh, the purposeful use of radio technology. Uh, and in seeking out that purposeful use of radio technology, uh, they seek to provide something of value uh, to the greater community. Uh, let's, let's call it a, a degree of altruism. And, and so uh, it is uh, possible and it's very useful in terms of capacity building and so forth to provide value added services uh, even when uh, other methods are present. Uh, amateur radio provides uh, organization a structure and universal methodologies that allow it to provide a level of service that isn't necessarily available from uh, public sources that are voluntarily or data, public data that is provided through social media or the internet and, and similar 
uh, similar methods that lack quality control structure and organization. So again, uh, we see amateur radio as being able to provide both essential services as well as a limited value added services uh, that provide that, that sense of purpose and community service that, that uh, many radio amateurs seek. Uh, we do this by providing infrastructure uh, and training uh, and uh, this builds our capacity and ensures that we're always available to provide the essential services uh, required. And of course, uh, within this latter context, uh, you know, again, we've talked about this in, in, in some of the other programs. Uh, our networks are available for both organizations and individual radio amateurs. Uh, so, for example, on the organizational level, it could be uh, local and state MCOM organizations. Or, or their supported agencies, uh, state, local, federal, whatever the case might be, whatever we're called upon to do. On the uh, other level is the individual response. This is the radio amateur who, who requires uh, connectivity and communication support for perhaps uh, uh, supporting his uh, neighborhood or his community in, in time of emergency or perhaps uh, providing communication support for, for uh, the CERT type organization, community emergency response team, uh, search and rescue teams, things of this nature. I do want to stress that as a general rule, we are not in the local MCOM business. We provide training that's useful to local MCOM groups. Uh, we're not here, however, to tell every local MCOM group how to operate, right? We, we can provide ideas and and best practices, and, and we can provide a, an infrastructure that allows them to operate more efficiently, uh, use their human resources more efficiently, and in a sense, we can act as a force multiplier uh, for uh, both local uh, MCOM groups as well as uh, individual radio amateurs. Uh, so uh, we want to get away from, from the model where, you know, there's, say, a small group uh, somewhere that, that tells you guys how to do things, uh, you know, well, you know, we're in charge. Uh, uh, you know, let, let's be honest, uh, in, a, in volunteer organizations, uh, you have to lead from the front, you have to lead by example. Uh, but if you try to, uh, if you try to control uh, uh, all the details, uh, you may as well uh, uh, heard the proverbial uh, cats. Uh, <laughs> so we were going to try and stay away from that a little bit. Uh, at the foundation of the, the RRI networks, of course, is, is survivability. And uh, those of you that have attended the, the Introduction to Disaster uh, uh, Communications Planning uh, courses, uh, you know, obviously, uh, by definition, disasters are catastrophic. And amateur radio is generally not needed for those essential services unless damage is sufficient to destroy or uh, disrupt uh, commercial or, or government infrastructure, right? So uh, our first and foremost responsibility as an organization is to ensure our networks are survivable, okay? Survivable networks uh, facilitate the, the restoration of networks of greater flexibility, uh, circuit capacity, and so forth, and they're capable of, under the uh, worst conditions, of getting the, the highest priority messages through. And of course, that generally means things like high frequency radio uh, and, and the like. Uh, as one, uh, uh, one executive at FEMA uh, uh, said some, in a meeting some years uh, ago, uh, high frequency radio is the weapon of choice. Uh, it's survivable because it essentially doesn't require distributed network topology. It doesn't require nodes uh, for the most part. Uh, there's, there's no towers to intercommunicate with uh, and, and so on. Uh, it's, uh, it's accessible uh, in, in the field uh, with a relatively simple equipment and so forth. But uh, to leverage high frequency radio, you need to have methods, you need to have organization. So you have to have, for example, methods to prioritize message traffic, to govern access, to ensure messages that are of the highest priority are handled first, for example. You need to have certain universal message formats with uh, selected network management data that uh, ensures that messages can be properly routed both automatically and manually through networks that uh, service messages and replies can be, be, be efficiently returned 
And obviously, you need to have uh, radio operators who have the ability to manage the accountability and record keeping and administrative skills uh, associated with, uh, with uh, uh, public service communications activities. And ideally, RRI is designed to provide all of these things, but RRI uh, really is its members, right? You know, that's everybody here on this call, for example. It, it's registered radio operators, it's certified radio operators. So, uh, you guys are RRI, and the ability to provide these services and support these functions is really a function of everybody here working together, you know, as a team and so forth. Uh, now, if you go out into the world of amateur radio, public service communications, you're going to run into uh, a wide variety of very useful methods. Uh, for example, WinLink, you know, it's built around Vera and Pactor. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful network. It's very, uh, very useful. Uh, there's uh, radio amateurs, uh, say, mainly on the local level that deploy uh, mesh networks and the like. Uh, this is all very useful uh, and uh, invaluable uh, in, in the broad picture of public service communications. RRI uh, is, encourages, however, a degree of mode diversity. Uh, so, you know, everything from the, the basic radio telegraph circuits, uh, CW, as it's called, uh, CW is that, that wonderful, you know, mode that really only requires a key, maybe a, a pair of headphones and a couple of batteries and a you know, low power transceiver and uh, you can use it under the, the uh, worst conditions. There's no need for peripherals or laptop computers or, or any of these, these things that exity weight, power consumption and so forth. And, and CW is just, uh, it's a mystery to the uninitiated, but it's, it's a very efficient way of communicating. Uh, we won't delve into it here, but the idea is that it, it has value in, in terms of its portability and its simplicity. Uh, and uh, it, it's a wonderful balance between the two in the hands of a good operator. It's very fast. It's very efficient. As a matter of fact, uh, in studies that have been conducted over the last uh, 15, 20 years in, in various, um, uh, during various MCOM events, uh, and yeah, exercises. Uh, a, a typical CW circuit will often handle upwards of three to 3.75 times more messages per hour than a voice circuit. Uh, but again, of course, the, the caveat of this, you know, uh, the, the little exception is that you need to have skilled, experienced traffic handlers and CW net operators to achieve that efficiency. But, but it does have some real advantages, for example, over voice communications and for portable operations, such as this little, little radio over here, you know, a little FT817 and you know, electronic here on a, a pilot's kneeboard and a wire tossed in a tree uh, sitting on the ground somewhere and you can send and receive traffic. Uh, and uh, so it's great for mobile communications too. Uh, and we, we covered this, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but the, uh, the uh, superior performance of CW during the 2016 uh, federal uh, Cascadia Rising exercise. Uh, and again, if you haven't attended the Introduction to Disaster Telecommunications Planning course, uh, we, we talk about this in, in greater detail there. Of course, uh, voice methods are valuable because number one, uh, they're fairly easy to learn. Uh, with a bit of practice and some drills and uh, knowledge of the ITU phonetic alphabet and basic pro words and, and uh, transmission procedures, one can become a, a fairly competent uh, voice operator in, in a relatively short period of time. And, and of course, voice methods are available everywhere, right? Every transceiver is sold with a microphone. Well, almost every transceiver. You can walk into almost any ham shack in, in the world and there's probably a microphone available, even if it just sits in the drawer, and, you know. And of course, the almost universal VHF FM repeater infrastructure throughout uh, uh, North America is also very valuable and it's, it's based on voice methods. Voice is a great method with, the old, again, the old the exception here being the fact that because voice is so accessible and because 
speaking is so natural, you will run into situations where inexperienced operators without good training and traffic handling skills will check in. They will attempt to operate within the, uh, the structure of the voice network, and they will gum it up very quickly, uh, like dropping sand into the proverbial well-oiled machine. So it requires a good net control operator, and it requires a what you might call a critical mass of very skilled, qualified radio operators to set the example of, of how the net's supposed to operate, how messages are supposed to be formatted and transmitted. And then, of course, in our modern age, digital methods are, have really taken off, and for good reason. Uh, for example, within RRI, we have the digital traffic network, the, the, the hybrid mesh network that uh, that we uh, is automated as soon as you upload traffic, it's automatically routed to its destination region. And uh, there's also some interoperability uh, uh, with other networks that's possible through the digital traffic station function. And it's accessible using, like WinLink, uh, by using data, Vera and Pactor methods. And, and again, like WinLink, I guess you can say one of the big advantages of DTN is not just the automation, but automatic error correction. Uh, that is at least within the relay process. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, error-free messages also rely on the ability of the operator to, to check the, uh, the, his input, <laughs> you know, to, to make sure there's no human error input when the messages are being formatted uh, at, the, uh, at the point of origination. And, and furthermore, it's also important, again, as we discuss in, in other courses, that the message may be hungry uh, via DTN uh, through these automatic error correction methods and so forth. But when it comes to the last mile of connectivity, it may need to be transferred to a voice method, uh, be it amateur or public safety or, or the like, uh, to, to get it to its addressee. And therefore, you should always keep that in mind when you're originating message traffic using any digital method. So uh, in addition, uh, any local or state organization is obviously at liberty to develop its own digital networks around any number of modes. Uh, we support that and we support it by what's called the digital traffic station function. So basically, if you want to build a digital network, be it a packet radio or a high frequency fuzzy mode of some kind, uh, you can do so uh, at your liberty. We're not here to tell you how to do it, but what we can do is you can, uh, we, if you want to find a volunteer or two who wants to serve as a digital traffic station, we can get him set up uh, to access DTN RRIDTN as essentially a gateway operator or gateway station where he's whitelisted to transfer traffic to and from the RRI digital traffic network to, uh, let's call it your, your unique digital network that you're operating, say, at the local or state level. Again, we're not here to tell you how to run your organization, but we are here to support it in the DTS function. Uh, is your gateway, if you will, or your uh, liaison uh, between your unique digital system and uh, RRI. The only requirement is, obviously, for messages to propagate automatically and manually uh, using standard methods for our system, we have to have a format, and that's the radiogram or radiogram ICS-213 message, right? Uh, because standardization is essential to support mutual aid, interoperability, and, and so forth, which is why we have a standard format and we have uh, uh, network management data that has to be appended to each message so that it can be routed through these various networks and network layers. So uh, being a DTS station is easy. Uh, it's any properly trained operator uh, equipped with at least a minimum a Vera or Pactor 1 capability. Um, that station is registered with RRI, uh, trained and authorized to access the network. And is it his job, or preferably there's some redundancy, maybe there's two or three people ideally that are 
are uh, uh, trained and familiarized and authorized, uh, whitelisted, you might say, to access our networks. And they're responsible for the interface between, for example, manual mode uh, networks or unique digital networks at the state or local level and the RRI uh, dig digital traffic network uh, infrastructure. And again, it can be somebody uh, associated with uh, an MCOM group, uh, traffic net, or, or even an agency, uh, but it is an amateur radio service function, right? It's, it's not shares and it's not Mars and so forth. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the digital traffic station function. It's the gateway, I guess you might say, between uh, either manual modes or unique digital networks at the state and local level to a digital traffic network. And we'll talk about the structure of DTN uh, shortly. The manual mode net st uh, structure uh, utilized by RRI is, is really uh, a hybrid between uh, ARRL national traffic system and RRI. Uh, you might think of the relationship uh, as being a bit like uh, the old Bell system, uh, you know, uh, I think everybody here is old enough to remember, well, maybe not, but most people are probably old enough to remember the Bell system. Uh, AT&T uh, uh, the, within the Bell system provided the long lines infrastructure and then the baby Bells, uh, you know, the local, uh, uh, you know, and, and local area transfer agreement phone services provided by the Bell operating companies, Michigan Bell, you know, uh, uh, Illinois Bell, whatever, uh, you know, uh, the, the local the local phone company was. Uh, uh, in many respects, RRI is the the overarching infrastructure, the long haul infrastructure. Uh, and the NTS uh, state and section nets are the local infrastructure. I do want to stress that there are exceptions to that, however, and again, we will cover that in, in this course. Uh, the manual mode net structure we found in exercises has some advantages over automated methods. Uh, for example, uh, it's very easy to dynamically respond to an emergency by establishing specialized point-to-point -point circuits to handle high volumes of message traffic. Uh, in many respects, uh, if it's done correctly, uh, you can have superior last mile connectivity, uh, maybe between an EOC and a disaster area and, uh, and uh, the agency uh, of some kind that's located outside that local area. Uh, with manual modes, it's a little bit easier for high profile stations to target a disaster area, uh, to uh, change frequency to avoid adjacent channel or co-channel interference as needed, uh, and to, to basically respond organically to these unpredictable problems that might arise in the, in the communications environment, right? Interference, fading, uh, you know, uh, propagation anomalies, et cetera. And of course, the, 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 one of the great benefits of manual mode net uh, structures, be it uh, say your local NTS net or the RRI region or area nets or whatever the case might be, part of it is the fun and camaraderie of actually interacting one-on-one -on -one with other net operators and being part of that group. Uh, you're not interfacing so much with the technology, but you're using your radio technology to interface uh, with others. It's got a kind of a human dynamic to it, uh, which, uh, which offers kind of an operating challenge, uh, camaraderie, and again, that universality. If I've got a you know, portable radio and I'm operating out in the field uh, in a major disaster area, all I need is a wire in the tree, a microphone or a key, and, and a portable radio, and I can easily access these manual mode nets. And regardless of where I establish my connectivity, we can go ahead and establish the routing and the methods to ensure that your traffic gets out uh, in an accurate and, and timely manner. So just to review, okay, the old NTS and to some extent the, the RRI infrastructure uh, is what you might call a, an inverted pyramid, okay. Uh, North America, is generally divided into three areas and again inverted pyramids so this is the 
the top of the inverted, inverted pyramid, we have these three uh, area, uh, three areas. Okay, so for example, if you look here at the at the western area, uh, you have uh, basically the FCC zones uh, six, seven, and then of course this is called twelve over here. It's got a slightly slightly different uh, connotation, uh, but you have basically the western area, you have the central area, and over here we have the eastern area. Okay. And so these nets provide for the interchange of traffic uh, within their area. Okay. And of course, uh, above this, it's not shown here, but there is, are a, a set of point to point circuits that provide for the flow of traffic between areas. And that's called the inter area traffic net. So again, we have these three area nets. Okay. And uh, these basically cover these three sections of, of North America, Western, Central, and Eastern, okay? Within each of these areas are region nets, okay? And the region nets are, are very similar to FCC call signs. So if you take a look at eight, okay, eight is Michigan, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, nine is Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, you know, of course, four is Virginia down to Florida, et cetera very similar to the FCC call sign structure. So for example, if you look here, this is region 10, okay, North Dakota, you know, Kansas, Missouri, et cetera. Uh, so this is the, the 10th region. Over here would be the ninth region. Over here would be the eighth region, first region, et cetera. So this is the next step down on that inverted pyramid. As you can see, it's kind of structured a bit like the air traffic control system, right? Uh, as we move down, the coverage gets smaller, okay? In other words, the subdivisions within the layer, net, layer networks are smaller. And, and this is a classical uh, method of layering nets based on the generally accepted concept and proven concept that as you go down to the local area, most communications traffic is local. Uh, then as you go up the inverted pyramid, uh, the amount of communications traffic volume uh, within an area uh, as the area spreads out and it, it just kind of lessens right uh, uh, so basically you have a state net here in michigan uh, then you have the region net for region eight for the three states then the eastern area and then you know of course the uh, uh, transcontinental or iatn traffic flow across country so uh, this is how a, a an area might look uh, from a both a temporal and network topology standpoint. So you'll see here, for example, uh, here's the region five. Uh, it consists of these sections or states here, okay? South Texas, North Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, etc. They're all part of region five, okay? And all of these nets here are also a member of the central area net. So for example, if I originate a message here in Houston, okay, it uh, starts at the South Texas section. It moves to region five. From region five, it moves to central area, okay? And then it goes to uh, its destination outside the area, so or, uh, within the area. So, for example, it might go from South Texas to Region 5 to Central Area Net, then say, for example, to the Ninth Region Net, and to its destination here in Illinois. So uh, you have this inverted pyramid, okay, the area net, uh, the smaller coverage of the region nets, and the even smaller coverage area of the local nets. Now, under routine conditions, these nets meet on a time sequenced or time domain uh, uh, level. Uh, take a look here. You can see that as a general rule, and there are variations at, at the state and local level, but as a general rule, that the state or section nets meet, uh, say this is the evening cycle, so they might meet at 0100 UTC, okay, which would be roughly 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. The region nets meet at 0145 UTC, 
area nets meet at 0230 UTC. The region nets for incoming traffic meet again here at 0330. And then of course, uh, the state nets meet again theoretically at 0400. Now, now there are exceptions to this and how this is structured, but that's the general, that's the general idea under routine day-to-day -day operations, okay? And so again, this is how the manual mode nets operate. And this of course shows the, the what we call the evening cycle or cycle four. The process is the same for the daytime cycle, which is cycle two. So there's four cycles theoretically, generally only two that operate on a day-to-day -day basis, which is the daytime cycle and the nighttime cycle. And this is the nighttime cycle over here. So this model is essentially the same for Western, Central, and Eastern area. It's just that the states change, okay? The region designations change, and of course the area net designation changes. So again, you know, if I go say from Illinois to say, uh, oh, uh, let's say North Dakota, okay, uh, message starts up here in Illinois, moves to the ninth region net, moves to the central area net. On the central area net, it's transferred to the tenth region net, lays in here. And then of course uh, he takes it to uh, or transmits it to North Dakota. Okay, and, and so on. If messages move out of their area, they are transferred between area nets using what's called the inter-area traffic net that links these together. And IATN are essentially specialized circuits that facilitate the exchange of message traffic uh, between area networks. Uh, historically, it's been voice methods during the day and CW at night, okay? Uh, but the IATN operators that uh, operate this process are at liberty to use the mode they think is best to do so. Uh, so uh, uh, each of these schedules are designated by an alpha letter, for example, a golf, echo, you know, kilo, et cetera. And it's the job of IATN operators, okay, to basically exchange traffic between areas. And again, you might think of these as point to point high volume uh, communication circuits operating either during the day uh, under cycle two or evening under cycle four. And again, this is uh, typically the schedules occur at times between nets to facilitate the flow of traffic between areas or as you might say cross country okay so that's the IATN system and we won't dig too deep into exactly how all these work but these are essentially just schedules uh, between uh, operators on different days of the week uh, different volunteers now the, the DTN topology uh, operates in much the same manner. Okay, we have uh, key area hubs. Uh, we have, of course, subordinate region hubs. And then, of course, we either have section DTS stations or we can have section hubs. Okay, uh, so for example, if you check into, uh, if you're a DTS and you have, you're holding, say, some traffic, you can connect to your region hub. So say, for example, if you're in Maine, you connect to the Region 1 hub. As soon as you upload that traffic, it automatically is routed, okay, to its destination region, okay. Uh, it goes up to the area, you know, might come back down to the region. It's, it's very similar in the sense of its topography. And of course, that's on, on purpose. Again, it not only is it kind of a classical method of layering nets, uh, but also it provides some redundancy, right, in terms of where you can inject uh, messages and how they can be routed if there's uh, this kind of self-healing in a way. Uh, you can even set up a VHF gateway using packet radio uh, and an HF transceiver uh, to, to automatically uh, upload to, to the network. Uh, so, so there's some pretty cool things that you can do with DTN. The big advantage of DTN here is that it operates 24-7. Uh, it's not uh, 
uh, unlike the, the routine manual mode nets, uh, it's not uh, it's not married to a temporal context. It's not it's not predicated on this uh, on this uh, uh, you know time domain uh, structure, and so uh, it's in some respects faster and uh, and better for a higher priority message traffic, and so this is. Uh, this is one of the, the benefits of DTN. Now, uh, uh, something new that we are implementing with an RRI, and we'll get a little deeper into this, is that we, uh, if you think of DTN as a common pipeline, okay, a little bit like the internet, right? The, the internet really doesn't differentiate between, you know, what type of communications traffic is being, being conveyed. Um, you know, there's millions of people using that pipeline every day. Within RRI, we essentially have two lines, okay? We have the traditional pipeline of uh, digital traffic stations interfacing with DTN, and that's this kind of blue line over here. And the blue line here is dedicated to uh, routine uh, communications traffic. Uh, and in time of emergency, it can accommodate any 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 type of routine emergency or priority traffic. It is a general rule. It is a day to day routine, you know, say, call it a subordinate pipeline within with a, the common DTN pipeline. OK, uh, think of it as sort of a you know, just a general network. However, uh, in in recent uh, in recent uh, in the last year or so, RRI and, and its Emergency Communications Committee and Board of Directors has been looking at the issues of reliability that have kind of haunted the old NTS system, uh, disappearing traffic uh, and uh, you know message delays and, and things of this nature. And what we've essentially done is we we've created what we call our Certified Radio Operator Program. And the certified radio operator program is designed to inculcate a high level of professionalism and quality control within the traffic system. Uh, and one of the processes that is has been developed is the idea of a what we might call, for lack of a better term, and I know it's not ideal, but would be the RRI virtual private network. So essentially, uh, within within this uh, process, uh, emergency priority uh, welfare fast telegram messages would be uh, I, uh, essentially transmitted uh, to a designated CRO here within their destination uh, region, okay, or section. And uh, the idea here is that the addressing is essentially unique. Uh, it ensures that uh, higher priority messages are basically transmitted to a certified radio operator, and the certified radio operator is responsible for ensuring that that message is delivered in a timely manner, or it's relayed to an operator of known credentials and abilities uh, that will agree to deliver it according to our high quality standards. Uh, so the idea here is, again, that uh, we don't want messages to disappear, we don't want them to be delayed, and we need to have some method in time of emergency to ensure that our uh, that each section and each region has people available that we know are properly trained and committed to timely, accurate message delivery that they are willing to build the relationships within their uh, respective sections uh, and so forth to get the message to its destination in the correct format and the correct uh, and with a high level of accuracy and, uh, and in a timely manner. So in day-to-day -day operations for routine traffic, and that includes our, our common everyday bulk messages, they're just treated as they always have been they can go to anybody that's a DTS, but when we get to the fast telegram or certified messages, welfare priority or emergency, the first uh, 
choice, if you will, is for that to be directed to a virtual pipeline uh, where the addressing is different and it's routed to its destination uh, where it will be uh, uh, downloaded uh, only by certified radio operators. And, and again, uh, this solves a couple of problems. Uh, uh, so if you, if you look historically at NTS, uh, there, there's a long history over the last several decades of, uh, of I guess what you might call institutional neglect, a uh, lack of training, a lack of, a lack of uh, you know, say a collegial approach where, you know, uh, the, the, say the legacy organization got uh, leadership together to, to solve certain problems. And so we have this history of message delays, uh, inaccurate, just not being, uh, 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 you know, delivered accurately and so on. Okay. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that there was no official training or, or other methods in place within the old uh, NTS system. So what we have set about doing is essentially creating this certified messaging process. Uh, it is going to start with the RRI digital traffic network, which will serve as the, the initial backbone for the program. Within this process, we have certified radio operators who are not just digital traffic stations, but they are also digital target stations for their state. And these digital target stations, okay, will be responsible for handling the higher priority messages, and that's the certified message welfare priority or emergency radiograms okay uh, the ideally each state will eventually have several target stations so number one there's redundancy and number two operators can operate um, and coordinate amongst each other in shifts to ensure that say for example an emergency if we're asking for a download frequency of every 15 minutes or every hour or every two hours uh, yeah, from DTS, uh, from the DTN, uh, they can take turns doing it, or one guy can do it for four hours and another guy does it for four hours and so on. The idea is that ultimately we'll have a number of these certified radio operators in each state or section, and he will be uh, the, the target station to which these higher priority messages will be routed. And any one of these digital uh, target stations will be able to accept these higher priority messages. Once that uh, certified radio operator or that digital target station uh, has uh, the message traffic uh, in his hands, it is his responsibility to get it to the last mile. Now that might be uh, delivering it himself, or it might be uh, ideally uh, he has you know, been active in, in state and section networks and MCOM activities and he knows who the competent operators are. And he furthermore knows that, for example, if the message is originated uh, as an RRI radiogram ICS-213 message, that it will be delivered as a, an RRI radiogram ICS-213 message on the appropriate form. So again, it's kind of a quality control function. Uh, each state within the pipeline, okay, within this this uh, this program, within this backbone, will have a unique address that is separate from the NTS routings, okay, and this keeps that traffic in that virtual pipeline. Now, this isn't to say the traffic can't be taken to an NTS net. Its purpose isn't to exclude NTS. The purpose is to have somebody who is certified and trained and part of the RRI program who is developing these relationships with an NTS to know who he can use on that net to ensure proper uh, formatting, proper delivery, proper servicing, and so forth for that message. And this pipeline will only apply to messages that are either certified priority, a welfare priority, or emergencies. So precedence is either certified welfare priority or emergency radiograms. Once this is being rolled out on DTN, we expect to also, because we do have to have interoperability, 
we expect eventually for all traffic operators to be familiar with the concept of the certified message. This process of using certified radio operators will also be extended to the RRR wind link to RRI gateways. Now, uh, essentially uh, within the wind link uh, templates uh, on the wind link uh, forms library, you will find a radiogram and a radiogram ICS213 message template. These messages incorporate software that ensures that radiograms or radiogram ICS213 messages are properly formatted. Uh, the software automatically excludes prohibited uh, formats and information that is uh, contra uh, contrary to interoperability and automation. And uh, once the message is formatted and the formatting operator has entered the data and everything and, and the text for the message and he, he wants to send it, he selects his destination region and WinLink routes that message destination region gateway operator. Okay, the gateway operator is then responsible. Uh, the WinLink RRI gateway operator is responsible for getting that message uh, to its last mile in the most efficient manner uh, available to him. Uh, so, for example, if you're in California and you go to WinLink, you select the RRI uh, radiogram form, you fill out your message. You select, say, Region 5 for the destination. Uh, it will be automatically routed to the Region 5 gateway operator, who ideally will be a certified radio operator. And he that means he's trained, he's qualified, he, he knows what to do. Okay, He's a competent traffic operator. And he will be responsible, say, for example, to getting it to the say the destination's Dallas, Texas, you'll be responsible to getting it to a network that serves the Dallas, Texas area, right? It might be the North Texas section net. It might be the Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth uh, VHF net. Uh, it's, it's up to him and his discretion to get that message to a reliable, competent operator. That operator at the last mile isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a CRO. Okay, you be an NTS guy, you might have nothing to do with RRI, but it has to be an operator who agrees to use the, the format that is uh, required, uh, the message form uh, to deliver, it for, uh, for example, if it's specified as an operating note, uh, and so on, uh, and is essentially cooperative with the, the goals and methods of uh, Radio Relay International. Okay. So this is another method through which uh, messages can be originated on WinLink, even by a very inexperienced operator. The software within the uh, WinLink templates walks the inexperienced operators uh, through the process so that he formats a proper message. And then he can select the destination region from a drop-down list, hit send, and then it appears over here at the region gateway for its destination where a certified radio operator picks it up, he reviews it, he decides what to do with it based on his, his discretion. Uh, if it's really important he, and he has telecommunications capabilities available, working telephone, working internet, he might deliver it directly or he might uh, pass it on to a, a known uh, competent operator, say on one of the section nets or a region net, whatever the case might be. Again, based on his judgment, the time sensitivity of the message and so on, okay? So within the RRI system, uh, you uh, have to understand that we have two configurations. Routine is our day-to-day -day operation. Uh, it's assumed that all messages are either routine or certified. Uh, these messages are basically, you know, uh, not super time sensitive, right? Uh, uh, you might be uh, anything from a birthday reading to a net report to, you know, uh, thanks for the enjoyable QSO. It's just the routine stuff that radio amateurs might transmit. Uh, emergency configuration is different 
Uh, what we do in emergencies is we implement the National Response Plan, okay, and we may take any number of steps that will be announced uh, in a bulletin. Uh, so, for example, we may activate certain nets, say uh, those that are in the disaster area. We may establish priority entry point watch frequencies for either voice or CW communications or a digital method on certain frequencies. And these are the places where operators in the field can take uh, their priority traffic, uh, maybe for certain agencies or certain types of welfare traffic, et cetera, and they can find an outlet for it. Uh, we can establish those point-to-point -point circuits to speed high volumes of messages between a disaster area and uh, the, uh, the remainder of the RRI network. We can identify certain states or sections as targets for certain types of messages, for example, situation reports, weather observation reports, such as during a hurricane, or <clears throat> operational readiness reports. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that we can, uh, we can uh, say, for example, have a volunteer of Pennsylvania whose job it is to prepare a modified ICS-205 form indicating uh, all the uh, stations that are reporting as being active in the disaster communications activity, uh, what agencies they have uh, uh, capability to deliver messages to, uh, what uh, networks they're affiliated with, which MCOM groups they're affiliated with, this allows him to create a searchable spreadsheet so that if an agency calls and says, can you get a message to Glens Ferry, Idaho? Well, you know, I can look at the, or somebody can look at that, that uh, ICS-205 spreadsheet and say, oh yeah, we have an operator there, he's on this net, and we can expedite the flow of that traffic to that particular net. Uh, so for example, a network management coordinator typically performs this task and he may he can be located in any state outside the disaster area. He collects the operational readiness reports that provides the data for the ICS 205, and then he's uh, uh, this guy uh, compiles the data, creates the spreadsheet, and then makes it available to everybody within the system that needs it. Uh, and uh, likewise, another thing we can do under under the National Response Plan is instead of maybe digital traffic stations. Uh, and the like, uh, RRI gateway operators downloading messages once or twice a day, we might say that based on this disaster and the volume of traffic, we want you to, to, uh, to download traffic every 30 minutes or the hour or every three hours or whatever the case might be. Therefore, ensuring timely delivery, for example, of welfare message traffic uh, and the like. So there's all kinds of things within the uh, in the national response plan, which will allow us to to reconfigure the traffic system in such a way that we can support a disaster operation. Now it's important to remember that we want to always work with NTS and Ares and all the different MCOM groups whenever possible. But we also have to recognize the reality that within the NTS program there are a minority of locations that don't want to work with RRI or be part of this, this process. We have to have the ability to perform these functions ourselves. Uh, and this plan allows for that, you know, uh, uh, capability when necessary. We can operate independently uh, uh, if necessary to support a, a disaster operation. So that's uh, kind of a rundown of how uh, how the network structure operates. And I know there's a lot of information we're covering here if you're not familiar with it, uh, but uh, we will be posting this to YouTube so you can kind of kind of look through it again and, and understand uh, the process. Now to uh, 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 go through the next phase of this, I, I mentioned at the beginning that in order to achieve automation, in order to achieve interoperability, and in order to facilitate the origination of reply messages, as well as what's called a service message, and a service message just indicates a delivery problem or a request for clarification on an address or the like, we have to have a standard format. 
when you transmit an email, the internet requires a standard format. When you go to a web page, the internet requires a standard format for URLs, okay? It's no different in a, an amateur communications network. So uh, we utilize the universal radiogram format because number one, it has network data appended to it as a preamble, which defines network topology. It assigns accountability. It defines the temporal context, that is the time context within which the message is originated. It, uh, it allows you to essentially create a file of specific messages either originated or received at an EOC. You got something down here? All right, a, a service oh. center. Uh, uh, I don't can hear from this. Uh, uh, be sure to mute your mics, guys. Yeah, be sure to mute your mics. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, uh, the idea here is that we want messages to remain intact through the last mile. And most importantly, if you're going to have an automated hybrid mesh network, that is the digital traffic network, you have to have a methodology for automatically routing these messages. The radiogram provides all of this. Now, of course, this process is, again, not new. It dates back to the telegraph era. Uh, telegraph companies had the same problem, right? They needed to assign accountability. They needed to charge for the message. They needed to notify the, the person who received the telegram, you know, 1,000 miles away or 200 miles away, needed to know the date on which it was uh, drafted and tendered for origination. He needed to know the time at which it was drafted and tendered for origination. I want to stress right now the the a the radiogram for there's no such thing as the ARRL radiogram format. Uh, there, there's no such thing really as the RRI radiogram format. The radiogram format is essentially a telegram transmitted by radio. And the methodology dates back really to the telegraphy and is carried on today in the internet just with greater complexity. Uh, for example, if you take a look at this radiogram from 1940, it's got a message serial number. It's got a station of origin. In this case, it was the Michigan State Police radio station at Lansing, Michigan, uh, WRDS, which was the police radio telegraph station in Lansing. It's got a check or a group count. It's got a time and date of origin, just like in an ARRL or RII radiogram format. It's got an address, in this case, to the Indiana State Police, and of course, a text message consisting of 35 groups or 35 words and a signature with the agency's name, okay? Uh, furthermore, it has the information uh, the operator who originated his initials or call sign in the case of a ham and of course it's got a message file uh, and some other uh, data for the administrative process so radiograms telegrams are nothing new they've been around forever <laughs> okay uh, this uh, old message here doesn't make any sense because it uses a commercial code each of these words represents a phrase and so that's why the text doesn't mean anything to you, but the person receiving this message had a book with the same commercial code. This was a way of saving money in the telegram, okay? You could send, you know, say a 50 word message and only be charged for, you know, basically, you know, 10 or, or 15, uh, 15 words. Uh, but the radiogram is essentially the same. Uh, it's the same as an email. It's just transmitted by radio. And each of the message components in this network management data at the top has a purpose. Now, message number 213 identifies the file number for the message uh, for at the originating station. So for this station here, K QMN, okay, uh, probably associated with the city of Detroit, uh, Aries or MCOM group or OXCOM group. This is the 213th message transmitted, okay? And what he'll do is after this message is transmitted on the net, 
it goes into a file in sequence, right? It's going to be, you know, uh, after 212 and before 214. And that'll allow the operator to reference that message should a reply or service message be received. Uh, so that's the idea behind the message number. Okay, this is an administrative tool that number one allows you to keep track of your messages in a disaster. But second of all, if there's a problem with that message during the relay or delivery process, all the delivering station or the station attempting delivery has to do is reference that serial number. You might send a message such as reference message number 213, Lieutenant Navin unavailable, please identify alternate official name and title. Okay, so the message serial number allows a, or a, a station may send a message back uh, from a, officials and reference message number 213, okay, uh, uh, establishment of of uh, establishment of temporary morgue at Cleveland Intermediate School approved by State Department of Public Health or something like that. This makes it much easier when you get a reply or there's a problem with delivery to immediately identify the message with which that reply is associated. Otherwise, without a message serial number, you may find yourself looking through dozens or even hundreds of messages in an EOC trying to figure out what, what message is this guy talking about? Or he's going to have to waste circuit capacity by, by describing the content of the original message, which can be a big time waster uh, in an MCOM environment. So the message serial number has real value and is very important. Okay. The precedence governs access to the radio circuit, and it determines in what sequence stations can transmit traffic. So, for example, uh, if you look over here, uh, we essentially have these precedences. Uh, let's look at them from most important to least important. I'm going to kind of do it opposite of the slide. An emergency message is life critical. Okay, it's a request for aeromedical evacuation. Uh, it's notification that a, a dam has broken and indicating uh, evacuation is essential. Uh, it's something that's life critical and it's always spelled out, E-M-E-R-G-E-N-C-Y in the preamble, okay? Priority is the next lowest uh, precedence. It is something that is very time sensitive in nature, typically official agency traffic. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, three water buffaloes required at uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, route to fire station number five, such and such an address. That would be a priority message, right? Uh, a welfare message, abbreviated W, okay, is something pertaining to the well-being of individuals in a disaster area. So you're operating a you know, say, for example, a service center or something of that nature. People have no cell service. There's no internet. Uh, at least you don't have the internet capacity and the time to let people use an internet terminal. Uh, you can originate welfare messages where people say, everybody's safe here. Uh, please don't worry. We're staying with Aunt Edna. <laughs> you know, uh, no, no cell phone service will contact you. Uh, when possible. It can be anything of that nature. Then we have the certified message. And the certified message, as we'll describe here shortly, is a unique personal radiogram, okay, other than bulk traffic. And it's furthermore de uh, defined as a message in which the addressee uh, knows or has a direct connection, a direct connection, uh, either personally or by action with the originator, okay? And these messages are routed through the CRO process, uh, and they are considered uh, more important than just uh, a general routine ram or a bulk message, a uh, bulk traffic message, okay? So they get some special handling. 
Now we'll digress for a moment and we'll talk about the certified message. The certified message is any message other than emergency priority welfare or routine, which meets the following criteria. criteria. Uh, the er originator should have a reasonable expectation okay, that the address, phone number, and other contact information contained in the address is timely and correct. So in other words, you, we run into this with NTS a lot. You will see people originate messages such as, uh, please renew your amateur radio license or uh, welcome to amateur radio. And there's nothing wrong with those messages, except that more often than not, the address and phone number are harvested from obsolete databases on the internet, things like whitepages.com, for example. And a large percentage of these messages are uh, uh, have bad address information associated with them. And now, there's nothing wrong with welcoming a new ham to, to ham radio. That's great. And sometimes you get lucky and, and you get a guy who, you know, you can introduce to, hey, you know, uh, welcome to ham radio. You know, can I help you out with anything? Or, you know, why don't you come to our local radio club? It meets here at such and such a day. Uh, you know, they, they can be useful messages. But there's also a bit of a morale problem uh, with them in that people get a little bit tired of uh, messages with bad addresses. So uh, a, a bulk message like uh, in which the, the originator doesn't really know the addressee, the addressee's done nothing to express interest in what he's offering, uh, for example, it does not qualify as a certified message. Uh, so basically, to qualify as a certified message, you have to have a reasonable expectation that the address and phone number and email uh, contained in the address is timely and correct. Uh, number two, the message transmitted has to be unique in character. And by that, I mean it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, something that's transmitted day after day, month after month, as kind of the bulk messages are. It, it's a unique radiogram message. Uh, the message that's transmitted or originated, uh, it's originated as the result of a prior relationship or transaction between the originator and the addressee. So examples would include something like a birthday greeting, a Christmas greeting, uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, a radio amateur joins a club and in the process of joining the club, uh, like the Long Island CW group or something of that nature, he provides on a membership application, you know, his name, his address, his email, etc. And uh, he's engaged in an act or a transaction that has shown that he has a direct connection and interest in the organization. So it's perfectly appropriate, for example, for the Long Island CW Club to send him a radiogram and say, okay, to, you know, Joe Smith, W2ABC, you know, 1325 Canal Street, New York, you know, city, such and such, uh, email, phone number, such and such, because they you know that's known to be accurate. And uh, then the message can be welcome to the Long Island CW Club. Uh, we're looking forward to having you participate in our weekly um, training classes and meetings. Uh, 73, you know, Joe Smith, you know, Long Island CW Club, that would be a certified message. Uh, a message that, for example, said uh, it was sent to a random ham that said, please join the Long Island CW Club, where, you know, there's no expression of interest in it by the addressee, would not be a certified message that would be routine. Okay. Another example is, you know, personal communications between family and friends, you know, uh, our, you know, uh, send it to your aunt who says, you know, we're going to be having our you know, family reunion at, at uh, you know, Echo Park, uh, you know, uh, June 3rd, you know, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you there. That, that's appropriate as a certified message. So the certified message is essentially a routine radiogram that uh, is uh, unique and personal in nature. And therefore, uh, 
If we want it to be treated as one might the old fast telegrams in the telegraph industry, we want it to be treated with respect. Uh, this is a way of providing good quality customer service, outreach, public relations, uh, relations within the amateur radio community and so forth. And certified uh, messages will be transmitted via the digital target station function just like priority welfare or emergency messages. Okay, So again, bulk traffic, for example, is always carried under the routine precedence. Uh, it, uh, you know, again, uh, it's defined as, uh, you know, the originator has no prior or direct relationship with the addressee, etc. Okay. Uh, common text messages are, are a good example. All the traffic shall always be classified as routine and shall all be always be transmitted outside of the RRI uh, virtual private network. Uh, handling instructions. Uh, handling instructions basically tell the delivering operator or a relaying operator what he or she should do with the message traffic. Uh, there's a, a number of these, some of which are actually obsolete in the modern world, and RRI will probably eventually eliminate some of these. Uh, they're a carryover from the NTS days. But for example, uh, HXC uh, is report time and date of delivery to originating station. Okay, uh, HXG, you know, if message is undeliverable, you know, please, uh, you know, please uh, cancel uh, and uh, service message back or something of that nature. Uh, we can look at these uh, later, but they're, they're readily available in some of the documents. The thing to be aware of with some of these, they do increase demand on circuit capacity. If you, for example, use this HXC message for every routine or certified message you send, every message you send is going to require a reply, so it's going to double demand on circuit capacity. So you should use some of these sparingly, right? Uh, because you don't want to gum up, you know, let's say, for example, again, disaster situation. You don't want to put HXC on every message unless it's very important because you will essentially double the number of messages being conveyed via that circuit okay, or via that net. And that can be really critical in time of emergency, as we discussed in the Introduction to Disaster uh, uh, Communications Planning course. Okay, So uh, take a look at the HX handling instructions and uh, well, uh, you'll, you'll kind of see the differences between them. The station of origin is the operator or station that first injects the message into the network, into the RRI traffic system or into the NTS system. Remember, the two are generally interoperable. It is not the call sign of the person, if he's a ham, that appears in the signature. Okay, the purpose of that mess of that station of origin is to indicate uh, to uh, an operator engaged in either the relay or delivery process to whom he should transmit a reply. Okay, so I'll give you an example. If W8ABC calls W8XYZ on the phone and says, can you send a message on my behalf? Okay. The station of origin is WAXYZ, not WABC. And now why is that? Because WABC obviously is not active in the traffic system. So if a reply has to be transmitted or there's a problem with delivery, the guy that's on the nuts is W8XYZ. Okay. So if I call a ham, say a ham from Nashville, Tennessee calls me and he doesn't have the ability to, to be active on, on the traffic system, the station of origin would be my call sign, okay, not his, okay, because I'm the guy who's actually putting the message into the system, okay. Uh, the check is the number of words in the text of the message, and this works just like the checksum in digital communications methods. The receiving operator counts the number of words or groups in the text of the message, okay, and 
he makes sure that he has the same number of words. If not, he goes back to the station from whom he's just received it and he requests clarification. So you can see here we have 12 words, right? Five, five, and two. You know, 12, mess uh, 12 words or groups here in the text. Okay. Uh, and it only applies to the text. It does not apply to the address or the signature. So that's the checksum or the group count uh, here. These, uh, again, uh, uh, as mentioned in some of the other training courses, uh, a zip code, for example, all the numbers are considered essentially one group. Uh, and this phone number here, 313, 878-7100, this is three groups, whereas this number, 313-878-7100, is one group, okay? Uh, these acronyms here, or these abbreviations, uh, MCRD uh, is one group, RTBN is another, okay, two groups. So it helps to, to understand that. Uh, if there is an ARL number radiogram in the text, or there is a radio relay code, the RRI radio relay code, uh, RRC precedes the check or ARL precedes the check. Okay, something else to kind of make a note on. Not super critical, but it's helpful to the system. Place of origin is the location of the person who signs the message, okay? The person who essentially drafted the message and tendered it for origination is not necessarily the location of the station of origin. Now, the reason for that, as you might well imagine, is let's say, for example, uh, you, you know, you're a, a public safety official uh, in the city of Detroit um, but the message is originated on a repeater, okay, uh, and a suburban area, let's say the city of Southfield, is where KQMN is located, okay. If I say Southfield over here, instead of Detroit, where Dr. Bass is located, that may lead to confusion, right? Is he the medical examiner for what if it's just Dr. Millard Bass Medical Examiner? Maybe Detroit's not in the signature, okay? We don't want to have that confusion, okay? Uh, so it's important that you understand the place of origin is not the location of the ham who injects the message into the network. It's the location of the person who drafted the message and tendered it for origination. Uh, so I always keep these things in mind, right? It's, it's a little confusing. Now it is possible that uh, an RRI certified radio operator might get a message from say Army Mars, okay? In that case, a message might be something along the lines of uh, Paris Island, South Carolina via Mars. Or if it's from a REA, you got it from a React net. It might be error, you know, a Detroit, Michigan via React or it identifies the fact that the message originated on a network, a communications network outside of RRI, something like shares or Mars or, uh, you know, a civil air patrol or whatever the case might be. So I append this information, say you're a Mars operator and you have to refile a message to RRI. Uh, you obviously indicate the place of origin and then you add via Mars or via React or whatever the case might be. So like, for example, if KQMN got this message off of a Mars net, uh, it would be Detroit, Michigan via Mars, okay? Uh, time of origin is always the time in UTC. Uh, that is Zulu or UTC time. Now, why UTC? Well, you can go to many parts of the country. Michigan's an example. Uh, Nebraska is an example. Uh, I think Iowa, I could be wrong on that, but uh, you can go to states where there are more than one time zone. Uh, and so, for example, in Michigan, uh, uh, Gogebic County and Iron County are in uh, central time zone, I believe. 
and the rest of the states in Eastern time zone. Okay, uh, so you you have to recognize the fact that messages move between time zones, or they have the potential to move between time zones, and therefore we don't want the time to be an issue of confusion, because time is important in the emergency communications environment. If you're in an EOC, they will have essentially a display, Today's is, these days is typically computerized, where uh, certain messages are displayed uh, against the timeline, uh, say on a, on a uh, computer monitor, or, uh, on a, or in the old days on a blackboard. Uh, so the t time is important, okay? Especially if there's several messages coming in pertaining to a subject, okay? It's important to know what time each of those message was, messages were drafted and tendered for origination in case one is delivered before the other. If messages one, two, and three are originated at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m., and for some reason, the 3 p.m. message arrives before the 2 p.m. message, and they all have different data, for example, about the capacity at a hospital emergency room or trauma center. Well, that's a problem because you might, uh, an official might act on obsolete data. And if there's a message going from the central time zone to the eastern time zone and, and it arrives at a state EOC, they're going to scratch their head and wonder, okay, what time was it originated? You know, maybe there's an error, maybe there's a mistake. So as a general rule, okay, the time of origin is always UTC, because remember, RRI is an international network. The same is true for the date. The new radio day, okay, starts at 0001 Zulu, okay? Uh, in other words, right now, as we're enjoying this program, it is actually the 12th of December in UTC, okay? It is 0131 Zulu, December 12, December 1-2, because the new radio day and international time started at midnight, or a minute after midnight, essentially, UTC. So understand that, too. Uh, the, the date is also in inter, uh, international time, okay? So this message was actually originated. Uh, you can see it was inter, uh, during daylight savings time, okay? So in Michigan, that would be essentially 9.03 p.m. June 15, okay? And so what are the, on the radiogram ICS 213 form, there is a a line or a box to convert this to local time. But again, we have to harmonize the network for the purpose of interoperability, okay? And so keep, keep this, uh, this idea, again, in the back of your head. For routine messages, the address is not particularly important, uh, but you do want as complete an address as possible. So you want obviously name, address, telephone number at the minimum, maybe an email if you have it available. Uh, for served agency messages, you should have a title and agency. Okay, so it's Lieutenant Frank J. Navin, Michigan State Police Emergency Management Division. And obviously the signature, the same rule applies. Dr. Millard Bass, Detroit Medical Examiner. For a routine message, it might be uh, Frank Navin, you know, uh, uh, 13221 Bobian Street, Detroit, Michigan. Hey, Frank, great to see you at the reunion last week. Uh, uh, see you next year. Uh, best regards, you know, signed uh, Millard. Okay, because it's a routine personal message or certified personal message. Uh, but for official agency messages here, okay, that might be, uh, you know, might be, uh, 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 you definitely want to have that additional uh, authority information. This guy needs to know too that this message was originated by somebody with authority, uh, not just anybody, right? So the signature, again, very important that you incorporate the name, title, and agency for any type of official traffic. So the basic rules are as complete an address as possible. Uh, served agency traffic should incorporate uh, both uh, title and agency. 
The zip code is very important for DTN because it's uh, one of the methods used for automatic routing and parsing of messages at the DTS function. Okay, so make sure you have a zip code associated with the message. And there is a methodology for international traffic, but we won't dig into it here. Uh, up to date phone numbers, obviously helpful for delivery. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, uh, try and try and, you know, keep you know, keep track of things. Uh, you know, uh, email is very helpful for delivering particularly routine messages and the like. Okay. The text should be as brief as possible. Uh, routine messages, we like to keep it to 25 words or less, but understand there is no uh, limit to served agency messages. Again, however, brevity is the soul of emergency communications. So we strongly encourage uh, as a cons as concise and brief a text as possible. Okay, uh, brevity is always important to achieve interoperability or just to use the the human resources in uh, an incident command post or EOC efficiently. The more junk they've got to wade through, the more the more wordiness, the more uh, unnecessary data, the more time. Um, scarce time they have to send, spend discussing content, figuring things out. If you could send, uh, encourage served agency officials to send a brief, concise, very uh, to the point message, everybody's better off, not just the ham operators, okay? Uh, again, uh, we tend to avoid case sensitive contents. I'll, I'll tell you why. You don't know how that message is ultimately going to be delivered at the destination. Let's say a message is transmitted via wind link to a state EOC or a local EOC, but it's addressed to a certain official. And that official is out in a fire truck or at a command post out in the field. And the communications that's available to him is a, a, a public safety talk group, a, a voice circuit. Okay. It's very uh, difficult and time consuming to send messages in uh, in mixed case over a voice circuit. Uh, it's also there's very few hams today uh, that can do it, if, if any, on a radio telegraph circuit. Uh, if you had a couple of old time press operators from Associated Press, they could send you know mixed case all day long via telegraph, but those guys don't exist anymore. So, you know, again, remember that you may originate a message. It may even cross the country via a nice, efficient digital mode. That does not mean that when it gets to the destination city or state, that it doesn't have to be transferred to a voice net to get it to its destination. And as a general rule for punctuation, uh, uh, we only use for the question mark. And uh, this is transmitted as x-ray. Uh, the question mark is transmitted as query, but upon delivery in written format, you convert these back to period and question mark. Uh, the public safety official that you deliver a message to, or even just the average Joe citizen, Aunt Emma or you know uh, Uncle, Uncle Joe, they're not going to know what the x-ray is or the query, you're just going to format the delivered message as a period or question mark. Okay, so uh, remember these little things here in the text. Uh, signature, I think we covered that in, in a fair amount of detail. Uh, you know, uh, again, name, title, agency, you can even include a phone number if necessary, but something important. Okay. Uh, there, there's additional things that you can add to that. And remember, too, at the bottom of the message, we want to incorporate some administrative data to whom we transmitted the, or, or from whom we received the message and the appropriate time and date at which that occurred. Okay. So uh, you formatted messages, you've transmitted messages, you've received messages. Remember that you should keep a radio log and you should keep a file of the messages that you've handled in an emergency situation or even for routine communications it's very helpful. So, uh, for example, you will want to record, you know, from whom you received a message at what particular time or 
uh, to whom you transmitted a message at a particular time. You want to again use UTC and you might want to uh, incorporate the net frequency uh, or net designator uh, that you transmitted the message on. So when problems occur, uh, you can trace them out. Uh, uh, now, the radiogram and the ICS-213 are really the same thing. Uh, when you hear uh, public safety people or hams talk about ICS-213 messages, all an ICS-213 message is essentially is a memorandum. It's, it's like an inter-office memo. Uh, it uh, basically has two uh, from... Uh, text, whatever the message uh, content is, and maybe the uh, subject dependent, uh, and you know, and the like. It, it's it's the same as an interoffice memo. Uh, so, in a sense, the radiogram uh, has the capacity to support any type of ICS two thirteen message. Now, there's been attempts by hams to create ICS two thirteen messages with numbered fields. Now, there, there's a great old expression. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. What they do is they see an example of a, an ICS-213 message in, say, uh, an, a, a, say, an emergency plan or in a FEMA document. And what they try to do is they, they assume that ICS-213, the format is static. That's the same for every agency. But in reality, it's not. The ICS-213 general message you're referred to is a minimum standard defined by the NIMS process. It's, it basically says this is the minimum information we'd like you to have uh, when uh, conveying uh, a, a, a record message, a written message. However, agencies are at liberty to add additional information above and beyond the minimum defined message and the NIMS training and the NIMS form. So, for example, Army Corps of Engineers, if you take a look at one of their ICS-213 messages, there's lots of additional fields. Uh, if you take a look at the Coast Guard, there's additional uh, fields in their, in their standard ICS-213 messages. And so you can't convey an ICS-213 based on this kind of numbered concept. So RRI dismissed that right away after doing some you know, very, uh, very easy research, right? So the ICS-213 is really a minimum standard, okay? And agencies can exceed that standard uh, if, if needed. Uh, the only difference between the radiogram and the ICS-213 message is the, the network management data, the message serial number, the station of origin, uh, the precedence, uh, you know, place of origin, et cetera. That is unique, but it is really a tool for managing the communications network. It has nothing to do with the basic messages. So this is a, this is RRI form 1704, and it's essentially a, an ICS-213. And if you, by now you should see that it's identical essentially in format to the radiogram with a very minor change or two. Uh, one of which is uh, it, we're basically taking the signature line and we've moved it up here into the uh, above uh, the text to kind of harmonize it with a typical ICS-213 message. So here's your network management data, your message serial number, your precedence, your station of origin, uh, your check, your place of origin, et cetera. Here's your address, okay? Here's your signature, okay? And then of course you can add the agency local time. So if you wanna prevent confusion, uh, you might say, okay, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, 1322, actually this would be, uh, uh, what would it be? I guess it would be, uh, uh, you know, 922 AM, you know, March 27th, okay, in, in, in Michigan. Uh, so uh, you might convert this to local time to prevent confusion. 
uh, perhaps uh, the subject was indicated in the original message that's an option. And here's our basic message right here. Okay. And so this is a standard radiogram, really, uh, but it conveys all the information, uh, minimum information required of an ICS-213. And if you do have a unique ICS-213 and you want to use the number of fields, you can do that. You can do one, you know, enter the data, uh, two, you know, enter the data, three, enter the data. Just make sure you have the correct check or group count associated with it. Okay. Uh, so again, this is basically a radiogram only with the text and signature swapped on the form. This ensures that any traffic handler can receive this data, put it on the correct form and deliver it, say, for example, via email or in an EOC environment and everything's there uh, that's needed. Okay. So that's that's the difference between between the two messages. So for example, this I would transmit this just like a radiogram. Message number seven, priority, kilo four, echo, Mike, alpha, one seven, Miami, Florida, zero three zero one Zulu, September two zero. Colonel Arthur, initial Charlie, a Becker, I spell Bravo, Echo, Charlie, Kilo, Echo, Romeo, Becker. Florida, initials Echo, Mike, Alpha, Director. Care of, I spell Whiskey, Delta, Five, Kilo, Quebec, Charlie. State, initials Echo, Oscar Charlie, Tallahassee, Florida, figures three, two, three, zero, one. Arthur, dot, Becker, at sign, Florida, dot, gov, break. Traffic exchange between manual, I spell Mike Alpha, November Uniform Alpha Lima, manual nets and the digital traffic and network occurs via I spell it Victor India Alpha via the digital traffic station function break. Sergeant Hans, I spell Hotel Alpha November Sierra Hans Schultz, I spell Sierra Charlie Hotel Uniform Lima Tango Zulu Schultz, Miami. Initials, Echo, Mike, Alpha, Director, Break, End, No More, Over. Okay, so that would be how you would transmit it. So I transmit this first, followed by this, and then the signature is totally transparent to the traffic operator, the way he operates 364 other days out of the year. But if I know it's being transmitted as a radiogram ICS-213 message, Okay, I will use this form for any kind of written or internet delivery. Okay, uh, so I'm going to put it on a form the agency is familiar with. Okay, uh, one of the things we talked about a little bit at the beginning is we showed you that old fashioned telegram with the commercial codes to save time and uh, utilize uh, uh, nets more, uh, or should say, telegraph circuits more efficiently, okay? Well, we have something similar in uh, the traffic system and it's called RRC, radio relay codes, okay? These are backward compatible with the old ARL number radiogram texts, but they add useful message text suited to emergency communications response. They are also compatible with the requirements of the RRI national response plan. 
So RRI developed these as part of the modernization of the traffic system and uh, public service communications activities. Their purpose is not to obfuscate content as much as it is to speed the transmission of message traffic, particularly on manual mode nets. RRC codes or the older ARL numbered radiogram text should always be translated um, upon delivery to the addressee. In other words, the addressee should never hear something like RRC 20, uh, I spell Tango Whiskey Echo November Tango Yankee 23, I spell Tango Hotel Romeo Echo Echo 3. Instead, he should hear whatever that stands for, right? So they're invisible to the addressee. And so if you look at this, this is available on the web page. You can see here that uh, no color code is basically any kind of text that is routine in nature. Uh, light green are welfare messages from, uh, corresponding to the old ARL number radiogram texts. Uh, light blue are basically uh, radiogram, uh, our radio relay codes that uh, correspond to various emergency communications functions. And the gold uh, uh, highlight is essentially uh, RRC codes that are text approved by the Red Cross uh, and uh, developed uh, primarily for the I Am Safe program originally, but they're available for any use. Okay. So again, remember that if you use one of these codes like RRC1, okay, which translates to everyone safe here, please don't worry. If my text is just RRC1, I spell Oscar November Echo 1, that's two groups, but the check in the radiogram is going to be RRC2, okay? Uh, in other words, two groups, but they incorporate an RRC code. So you can see there's a variety of them here. Okay, so if you take a look here, for example, uh, uh, you know, you can see like RRC 11, you know, establish amateur radio communications with blank on blank megahertz. So this might be uh, the way you would write this out on the radiogram would be RRC 11, I spell Echo Lima, Echo Victor, Echo November 11. I spell Whiskey Bravo 8, Sierra India Whiskey. Figures 1, 4, 1, 1, 5, break. Uh, so in other words, you, the, you know, uh, RRC 11, WB8, SIW, 14115 so that my whole text okay is just going to be four groups rrc 11 wb8 siw 14115 four groups for this text here because i have the two blanks in sequence right same thing here rrc 17 okay so this might be rrc 17 i spell c Sierra Echo Victor Echo November Tango Echo Echo November 17. I spell Whiskey Sierra Charlie Uniform 838. Six. I spell Sierra India X Ray. Okay, so this is four groups RRC 17, WSCU 838. Six, I spell Sierra India X-ray, okay, four groups. But when you deliver it to the addressee, you translate it to React Communication Services also available, establish React Communications with WSCU 838 on channel six, okay. Uh, so uh, this is translated on the delivery message or delivery message form. Okay, and you can go through, there's just a whole bunch of these. Uh, these are the messages that were developed uh, when we went and uh, worked with the Seattle Hubs Group and the Western uh, Washington State section of the ARRL and WinLink and others to put together the I Am Safe program. And so these are our new uh, welfare message texts. 
And then of course, there's a bunch of routine ones in here. And then of course, we have different messages here that are unique to managing an MCOM response. So you can take a look at 78, 79, and 80. These requests, uh, 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 for example, sit rep messages or weather observation messages or the like. But again, you put RRC in the check, you count the number of words or groups in the untranslated text, uh, when you deliver, uh, you translate the RRC code into its actual text that the, uh, the addressee will understand, okay? Uh, pretty straightforward kind of stuff. So here's a good example, okay? If you go back here, let's look at what RRC 78 and 75 are. So look up here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11, 12 groups, right? So the check is RRC 12, okay? So in this case, it's RRC 70, I spell Sierra Echo, Echo Victor Echo, November Tango Yankee, 78, I spell Echo India Golf Hotel Tango, eight, four, I spell Foxtrot Oscar Uniform Romeo, four, I spell Whiskey Bravo 8, Sierra, India, Whiskey, Michigan, X-Ray, RRC 70, I spell Sierra, Echo, Victor, Echo, November, Tango, Yankee, 75, I spell Foxtrot, India, Victor, Echo, 5, figures 10115, initials Charlie, Whiskey, okay, break. Uh, so if you look over here on the previous one, we'll look and see what 78 is. Uh, 78 is set rep messages requested every blank hours, your location, transmit to station blank in such and such a state. So you can see here that this basically transmits thing that says basically set rep messages required. Bottom of your slide. I'm sorry? At the bottom of your slide. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, did I hit something I shouldn't? No, no, except for the frequencies. The bottom of your slide really is how it translates out. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Sit rep message requested every four hours, your location, period. Okay. Transmit to station WB8SIW in Michigan, period. Okay. Priority entry point frequency established on 14115CW. Okay. So that gives you an example. Okay, so let's uh, kind of close this kind of uh, broad overview of, of the traffic system with a few uh, final slides. So why do we handle routine traffic? Okay, I mean, let's face it, you, you know, this comes up all the time. Why would I want to send a radiogram when I can pick up the cell phone and call somebody in California, or I can, uh, I can send an email? Well, the purpose is that number one, you have to learn how to handle important messages when the cell phone and email aren't available. And you can do that because a routine birthday greeting and the process of conveying that routine birthday greeting is the exact same process as conveying a welfare message or a priority message for an agency. It's understanding the process and the methodology and practicing that process and methodology is what, where the value exists, right? Now, yes, you can pick up a phone. 50 years ago, you would pick up a phone place, a long distance phone call. But the point is that we handle traffic through NTS or RRI. We do it to exercise the system, uh, keep people engaged and to practice these skills, right? And so you get this training benefit. We keep the nets active, reason to check in periodically once a week or every night or however you want to do it. It ensures operational readiness, okay? Uh, it it uh, provides a social dynamic. You know, you, people have the fun and camaraderie of participating in nets. So there's a reason to handle traffic. Yeah, it's fun and beneficial, there's a sense of camaraderie, but if one can handle routine messages accurately and he understands the process, he's better equipped to handle important messages in time of emergency. Furthermore, it requires that you develop a station where you can communicate on nets regardless of 
time of day or conditions or frequencies, then it's more demanding because you have to be able to communicate to various points in your state or your region, uh, regardless of propagation conditions. It's not like contesting where you just work the people you can hear, okay? Uh, so it, it's kind of demanding from a technical standpoint, okay? So there's a lot here to learn. So, you know, I've spent, you know, essentially two hours going through a lot of information, right? Uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information. I will post this to YouTube so you can kind of review it at your convenience. I'd be happy to share the slides, uh, but understand that the best way to get involved is just to listen to NETS, listen to the procedures, uh, digest the training material here, uh, get involved in traffic handling. And, and I guess I'll close with a really important point. Do not be afraid to make mistakes. If you're new to this uh, and you're worried about, you know, maybe sounding inexpert or foolish on the net, don't worry about it. The, you know, master chief, you know, on, on the LST is not standing over your shoulder, uh, getting ready to, you know, uh, uh, give you all, a whole load of you know what because he made an error. This is amateur radio. Routine nets are the place to learn. Routine nets are the place to make your mistakes. Uh, jump in, uh, give it a whirl. Nobody's going to laugh at you if you make mistakes. Because everybody started by making mistakes. But over time, you'll become really good at this if you follow the standard procedures that we've talked about in the basic radio telephone uh, uh, you know, uh, training class and the like. Originate some routine messages to family and friends. You can start out really easily with the WinLink templates. Uh, that'll get you started. And uh, you can go ahead and uh, have a lot of fun uh, doing this. And in the process, you learn some very useful skills that may serve your community at, at some point uh, in the future. So with that, uh, everybody, I am going to uh, stop the share. And now we can get into questions, comments, or Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I'll give you a comment, Jim. Uh, yep. No Rotten Tomatoes. Um, templates are available not just in Windlink. They're also available in the Outpost Packet Manager program and in the FL Message program. And yep. they are uh, set up already for RRI. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Thank you for bringing that up, Charles. Yeah, very useful. AW, hey, um, a yeah. couple of comments uh, teaching my group here the, in Aries on these uh, radiograms. If you're translating the time over from Zulu to anything else for locally, be sure to put an L after that time. Otherwise, it confuses people. Yeah. Also, you don't put an X as the last uh, finishing of a, a message. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, we didn't get really deep into how to transmit the radiograms, unfortunately, because we had two hours, right? But yes, you, you, uh, you don't, there's no need to send an X at the end of your text. Or there's no need for that. Again, it's about preserving you know, the little nuances that preserve circuit capacity. But thanks, John. Those are very useful uh, additional pieces of information. Yes, typically, you know, if you write down something like uh, 1315L, that's local time, you know. Uh, or at least 1315, you know, PDT, you know, Pacific Daylight Time or something that's going to, you know, going to not confuse a served agency official. That has happened a couple of times when someone didn't do that at Pierce County. Oh, yeah, yeah it happens a lot. And, and again, as I mentioned in the disaster telecommunications planning course, uh, temporal context is really important in an EOC or command center. Uh, because, you know, for in the example I often use is, uh, let's say you have a mass casualty incident and you're getting updates every, say, 15 or 20 minutes from uh, several trauma centers or ERs in the area, and they're telling you what their capacity, remaining capacity is. <laughs> it's really important that you get them in the right sequence, or you can at least put the, the messages you receive in the correct sequence, particularly if you're at the public safety answering point dispatching you know, uh, transport to, to those locations. And uh, hams, I think, sometimes forget about the, 
the fact that there's a whole administrative process that goes into what we support that we don't necessarily think about because it's not in our day-to-day -day life, but public safety officials really do. One last thing just came to mind. If you're taking messages, especially requests for uh, equipment, make sure you get a signature because later when they go to get um, reimbursed by FEMA, if you don't have a signature, they're not going to pay you. In, in the ideal world, you will be a conduit. Um, the message router and so forth will be responsible for getting that message to you. And in, in the ideal world, they will hand it to you to transmit. Yeah. Some messages may go to an EOC, another one to you know, a different radio service. But yes, you should. You should still accept responsibility for the fact that you need to have verification for important messages, for sure. And it is better if you hand them the form and you coach them on what your requirements are, explain your benefits, your limitations, and then they hand it to you. And you have their handwriting, their, you know, their signature, and so forth, that instead of your own. You know. But sometimes you have to play a telegraph clerk, too. Uh, they ordered a water buffalo for a fire fighting at a local community here. Uh, several months later, they tried to get reimbursement, uh, and they didn't have a signature for who ordered it, and it took an act of Congress to get paid for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably had to call a local congressman and have him intervene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. You have to call in a favor. And of course, if you've ever worked in, in government, you want to call in those favors only when you really need them, because uh, it's like a savings account. You know, you put a certain certain amount in on one side of the ledger, and then you want to only do withdrawals when absolutely necessary. <laughs> you know, with your from your political capital. You know, <laughs> and and what we do, we've trained our people. Uh, if they get a signature, to put slash slash. S I G N slash slash right after. Yeah, and, and that method, uh, things like that are really up to the discretion of your your whoever whatever agency you're working with, you know. And it comes to how they want to handle those little nuances, you know. Uh, but but uh, good points all around, John, for sure. Do we have uh, other comments or questions or anything else uh, from the group? Presentation, by the way, James. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got a few more minutes here. It's 10, 10 p.m. Uh, any other, uh, well, I'm sorry, Eastern time. Uh, where I am, it's 9, 10. I'm looking down at the computer. The computer's on, on standard, or Eastern time, and I'm here in Central time. I'm all, all goofed up here. Uh, <laughs> I should put everything in UTC, and then, and then I would be good, right? Uh, so... Anyway, any other uh, questions, comments, thoughts, uh, in, insights, uh, personal experiences that would be helpful uh, to the group? You feel free to speak up. Okay, well, uh, you guys know where to find me. Uh, so, uh, you know, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll get this posted, uh, this updated uh, TR002 posted to, uh, to YouTube, and I'll send out uh, uh, a PDF with a copy of the slides to, to everybody. And, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, please, uh, I do want to make one quick announcement, uh, and I will confirm this. I'm still planning to be here on the 14th for uh, this Saturday's training course. However, uh, I did not communicate with the wife, nor did I know that there was supposed to be a wedding that we had to attend on that Saturday. So I will let you know if I have to cancel that. I hope not, uh, because I'm stuck here in Houston on business. I may, it may all be moot and I'll be here on the 14th anyway, but I'll let you guys know on that here within a probably 24 to 48 hours, uh, what's going on with that. Um, and other than that, uh, just uh, wish everybody uh, a good night. Uh, thanks for being here. And I hope you found the, the course helpful. Uh, as always, you're, you're welcome to reach out, uh, offer uh, any ideas, thoughts, uh, insights, uh, 
uh, recommendations for improvement uh, for whatever the case might be. One more question. Yeah. You, uh, those of us that have completed the four required courses, are we going to have some sort of a certificate or uh, posted somewhere that we've completed the uh, requirements for CRO? Yep, yeah, yeah, certainly will. You'll get a nice, a nice uh, certificate, uh, uh, very similar to the registered radio operator certificate, except it's uh, it's a kind of uh, pinkish like the old uh, commercial radio telegraph licenses. Very similar in format, though. It'll look nice. I don't think I ever got that registered radio operator one. You must have joined early on before we started issuing them. How long have you been a member? Uh, You've been a registered radio operator, I should say. Two or three years. You should have gotten one. Yeah, it comes in the welcome package. You know, everybody gets a, a green RRI certificate. Uh, so uh, drop, uh, drop me an email to remind me to, I'll send it to our database manager and I'll have him get you a certificate in the mail. Okay, I'll do that then. Okay, sounds good. Okay, a anything else, guys? Okay, well, with that, I wish everybody a fine evening. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'll see you at the next training class. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Wade. Uh, thank you, thank you Luis. Appreciate it. I'll be down in your neck of the woods uh, December 28th, and I'll be in Puerto Rico anyway, but close anyway, compared to where I am now. Okay. Yeah. You let me know where we meet, we could meet. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do that for sure. Okay. Yeah. So email. You go yeah. to, you could go to, uh, uh, on my um, call sign on, uh, and, and email me. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you and and Emma and some others know, uh, Jorge, uh, that I'm going to be down there, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, get together uh, for uh, maybe uh, one, one day while I'm down in, in Puerto Rico. I'll be down there for about ten days. All right, all right. My sister lives in Killeen. Killeen oh yeah, Texas. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty close. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, I'll I'll definitely reach out to you. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, good night, everybody. Yep. Good night. Thanks. Good night.